Through Maud Gagne, Yeats became convinced of the righteousness of the Irish cause, but not necessarily of any sense of his own Irishness. In an Irish airman, there's a sense in which Irishness is a noble peasant thing. Like Kilcharton's poor. And he, Yeats, is more identified with this pilot, this interstitial figure, who seeks dissolution as the true outcome of his neitherness, neither one thing nor the other, neither Irish nor English. Elsewhere at this time, Yeats questioned as to why we should, quote, honour all those that die upon the field of battle when a man may show as reckless a courage in entering into the abyss of himself, unquote. And those of a culturally secure national identity may scoff at the pompousness of such a statement, yet for Yeats, as for many post-colonial people, identity is often an born from a confusion engendered by the loss of a native language and culture. This was exacerbating the Irish case by its proximity to England. As the stolen child shows, his conviction in the regenerative power of the mythological imagination instilled in him the belief that his poetry could actually formulate or rephrase the ingredients that he believed were essential to the success of Irish nationalism. At the same time, and I'll quote from here, he says, in relation to art, if we could take the Irishness and the Protestant ascendancy and bring the halves together, if we had a national literature that made Ireland beautiful in the memory and yet had been freed from provincialism by an exacting criticism, a European poise. And this is what his own work is about. In Under Ben Bulban, he invokes Calver, Wilson, Blake, and, and Claude, the Quattrocento, and then also has a line where he says, Irish poets, learn your trade. Sing whatever is well made. Simple thing. Now, he also have the local and the European in theatre. So Yeats, along with Maud Gaughan and Constance Gore Booth, um, this stage had rejected the genteel class and were fully active in relation to, in relation to getting a, a vibrant Irish artistic landscape happening, and they founded the Abbey Theatre, the first national theatre in Ireland. This is the manifesto. We propose to have performed in Dublin, in the spring of every year, certain Celtic and Irish plays, which, whatever be their degree of excellence, will be written with a high ambition and so to build up a Celtic and Irish school of dramatic literature. We hope to find in Ireland an uncorrupted and imaginative audience trained to listen by its passion for oratory and believe that our desire to bring upon the stage the deeper thoughts and emotions of Ireland will ensure for us a tolerant welcome. <laughs> you got that wrong. And that freedom to experiment which is not found in theatres of England and without which no new movement in art or literature can succeed. We will show that Ireland is not the home of buffoonery, easy sentiment, as it has been represented, but the home of an ancient idealism. Now, um, a key fav figure in the theatrical scene is John Millington Singh, who Yeats, a great friend of Yeats, who died early um, in 1909 from cancer. But Yeats encouraged Singh to go to the Aran Islands, where Yeats had been briefly for a few weeks, where people spoke Aran Isles off the west coast of Ireland, where people still spoke Gaelic and had spoken Gaelic in an unbroken tradition. So Singh went and wrote about the Aran Islanders, wrote about the people there. And he wrote a very famous play called The Playboy of the Western World, in which a chap called Christy Mahan turns up in an Irish town in the west of Ireland and claims to have murdered his father. It's a wonderfully eatable play. Now, <laughs> if Freud had read it, he'd be like, hey, right. he'd add it to the list of Oedipus Rex and Hamlet and Playboy of the Western World. So, of course, everyone in the town is intrigued by Christy Mahan, the father killer, and um, the women are terribly attracted to him until his father turns up looking for him. But at this point, through his sort of symbolic breaking away, he has, he's able to stand up to his father and, and does become independent. So the, the st it was the first play staged in the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, and there's a riot. The audience rioted. And they rioted about a line in which Christy Mann says to Peggy and Mike, who's the object of his in affections, um, he says, it's Peggy, it's Peggy I'm seeking only, and what did I care if you brought me a drift of chosen females standing in their shifts itself? Maybe from this place to the Eastern world. Shift is uh, Irish for underwear. So many women standing in their underwear. And there was a riot the first night. The audience went mad. Think back to 1913, the whole greasy till and had the havens to the pence and all that. Everyone was outraged and scandalized. Um, Peggy, interesting, Peggy and Mike's response to his... Um, his statement is, and you think you're a little bow to go straying along with the shiny Sundays of the opening year when it's sooner on a bullock's liver you'd put a girl than on the lily or the rose. <laughs> I'm glad you got that because it's, it's um, what Singh was doing was he was transporting the dialect 
in a heightened, exaggerated sense, the language of, of the Aran Islands and putting it on stage and saying, this is us, this is Irish people, this is what we're like. And what do the audience do? That goes, they go, we're not like that. But Yates was well able for them. He got up on the second night of the riots and he said, to them, he said you're a disgrace. You're a disgrace to Ireland. Now, in 1926, the plough and the stars, Sean O'Casey, who's from Sean McDermott Street, that's the street we looked at earlier, wrote two of the best plays of the 20th century. Sean O'Casey, um, the plough and the stars, another riot. Another riot. The reason this time, ostensibly the reason there was a riot this time, was that uh, there was a prostitute in the dramatist persona. Um, and also one of the rebels, it's about 1916, one of the rebels brings the Irish tricolour into a bar. People were arguing about that. Um, but a lot of people think that the, the problem may have been these lines um, from the Covey in the play where he says, look here, comrade, there's no such thing as an Irish man or an English man or a German or a Turk. We're all only human beings. Scientifically speaking, it's all a question of the accidental gathering together of molecules and atoms. One indignant letter writer to the Irish Times wrote, and I quote, after the centuries of persecution that we have suffered and the difficulties we have had in maintaining a sense of our own identity, it seems inexcusable that O'Casey and Yates would use the national stage to argue that Irishness did not exist. Of course, rising to the challenge of a good riot, Yates was irrepressible. On Wednesday, the 10th of February, 1926, the second night of the riots at the Plough on the Stars, Yates takes the stage again. It's recorded this, disgraced yourselves again. <laughs> Is this to be an ever-recurring celebration of the arrival of Irish genius? Sing first and then O'Casey. The news of the happenings of the last few minutes will go from, from county to county, from country to country. Dublin has once more rocked the cradle of genius. From such a scene in this theatre went forth the fame of Sing, Equally, the fame of O'Casey is born here tonight. This is his apotheosis. And O'Casey famously in his autobiography, in his autobiography, wrote about all the way home Sean McDermott Street, repeated to himself, apotheosis, 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 and then got in and looked it up in the dictionary. <laughs> just to make sure that he was actually being praised by Yeats as opposed to condemned, right? So, I diverged here into theatre for three reasons. One, to illustrate Yeats's continuing commitment to an artistic activism where an artist committed to forging the identity Two, to refer to the letter in the Irish Times as a confirmation of Yeats' success in his project. When people write letters saying that storytelling attacks an identity that is otherwise forged through storytelling, then Yeats' mission could be considered, if not complete, then in rude health. In the absence of a clear and distinct sense of Irish identity, he had helped to create one, and people now presumed it to be somehow transitory. The third reason that I refer to the stage is because it was through the rough and ready theatre of Singin' O'Casey that Yeats comes to the recognition of wisdom residing with fools and beggars. And I suppose Singh's plays, O'Casey's plays, they are, and again, one is rural. Um, Singh's work is rural. O'Casey's plays are urban. But they're rough. They're rough and ready. And it's crazy, Jane, 1932, Yeats' poem. Um, previously... You remember, they're all heroes, John O'Leary, Porrick Pierce. It's the heroic figure who will transform. And now, by the, we get to the 1930s, it's not. It's the, it's the simple person, or maybe the subterranean person who's the harbinger of, of certain truths. And the last line, the whole idea that no, nothing can be so. Let's read it. I met the bishop on the road, and much said he and I. Those breasts are flat and fallen now. Those veins must soon be dry. Live in a heavenly mansion, not in some foul sty. Fair and foul are near of king, and fair and foul are near of kin, and fair needs foul, I cried. My friends are gone, but that's a truth, nor grave nor bed denied. Learned in bodily lowliness and in the heart's pride. A woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, but love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement. For nothing can be sold or whole that has not been rent. So says Crazy Jane to the bishop. Strangely enough, we, this one wasn't on our school syllabus. <laughs> but I love this whole idea, apart from the whole rent and the possibility that Crazy Jane might be a prostitute, the whole idea of that rather than something is complete and then it can be broken, something first of all needs to be broken before we can perceive it as complete, which is almost like the trajectory of Leitz's life torn between these antinomies. Okay. Um,
Yates was so involved in the rapid and seismic changes that took place in Ireland from 1916 onwards, changes wrought in part by his nationalist poetry, that he spent almost his entire life engaged in the daunting project of creating a viable and vibrant identity for his recently liberated compatriots in the Irish Free State. In 1922, he became a senator. 1923, he received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And yet all the while, the, the, the FO voice, or the FY voice, or the FYI voice, it never left him, it never dissipated, so that finally, when he turns to face his own old age, he did it with a vengeance, which by...